You're listening to the Straight to Video Podcast with Rob Lane. All right, welcome along to a brand new episode of my show, Straight to Video. Massively appreciate you tuning in to what I can say is an episode pretty much 30 years in the making. Back in December of 1992, close to exactly three decades ago to the day when this show airs, myself and my friend Tot went to a couple of concerts on the extreme three sides to every story tour, one in Sheffield and the second in Birmingham. These shows would have a lasting effect on the journey I've taken ever since. And on today's podcast, I get to chat a little about that with my guest, Johnny Gioelli of the band Hardline, who were opening up on that tour. Many of you who know me will know the story, so I apologize for hearing yet another version of it. But for the rest of you, I hope you get to enjoy me going full fanboy during this chat as it was a lot of fun. Now, Johnny is without doubt one of the finest singers and frontmen of the hard rock genre, which is showcased on 100 albums which he has to his name, whether it be with Hardline, Axel Rudy Pell, Crush 40, or his most recent project, Enemy Eyes, whose debut album, History's Hand, is out now. We discuss all this along with tracing some of Johnny and his brother Joey's early musical journey, and it was a lot of fun to chat and hear how passionate and grateful Johnny is to this day to be continuing to make music and the experiences he's had along the way. Once again, this episode of the show is proudly presented to you in association with Affinity Photo, an incredible piece of photo editing software which I've been using for graphic design the past couple of years. It's used to create the podcast's episode art where you see each week, and it's an extremely affordable alternative to other programs on the market. Now it's still a great time to get on board with Affinity Photo and also Affinity Designer and Publisher as they've just announced a brand new version 2 platform with some great price discounts, so please check them out at affinity.serif.com. All right, really hope you enjoyed today's show. And if you want to learn more about Johnny and all his projects, you can find him on Facebook at Johnny G-O-L-E Official or on Instagram at simply at Johnny G-O-L-E or check out the Hardline website at hardlinerocks.com. But right now, please enjoy my straight-to-video chat with Johnny G-O-L-E. Hey, how you doing? Straight in there. Woo! <laughs> no messing. What's going down? Not much. Just trying to stay warm because it's freaking freezing over here. <laughs> Where are you, mate? Nearest big city is Nottingham. Okay, right on. You know Nottingham pretty well from Firefest and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. It's a great area. Sorry we screwed up your language, man. We fucked it up pretty good here in America. <laughs> Took a perfectly good language and destroyed it. Uh, it's all good. Thank you for doing this with us. I'm stoked we got to hook yeah. it up. How's everything over there? Are you relaxed? You said you was from like November 4th. I think you said you was like relaxing and just doing nothing. Yeah. So I thought I was going to have a little bit of a rest, but I've got another album to make. I've done 100 albums worldwide. So 101 will be December. And then January, we start production for another Hardline album. So that's that's 102. <laughs> and I just thought I'd be slowing down. What's your record for one year? How many have you done in one year? So I think four or five in yeah. one year. Awesome. Yeah, it's crazy. It's kind of stupid. But I'm, you know, what are you going to do? You know, you take the work and when you love what you do, it's not like, oh, my God, I don't want to wake up tomorrow because I have to go into the studio. It's just like I can't wait to get into the studio anyway. And I have three songs I'm already on my mind, three songs I have to record tomorrow and some gaming stuff. Anyway, I'm always damn busy. So diving into your background, which I'm familiar with a fair bit of, but it's pretty insane everything you've done and you continue to be so productive like we just mentioned. I'm going to try my best to focus on a few things, which I hope the listeners to this show will enjoy, but both those who are familiar with Hardline, but also bring it right up to date with, like you say, your 100th album. That's nuts. With the new release from the band Enemy Eyes titled History's Hand. This is right off the back of last year's Heart, Mind and Soul album from Hardline. Yeah. You've just finished some European shows, I think, with Hardline. Yes. Where did you fit this new record in? <laughs> I have no idea. I don't sleep. No, I sleep. I actually do sleep. So for me, life is balance and something has to give at some point. It's kind of like a give and take for me. So depending on what I have to accomplish, I just adjust. And, and you know, honestly, if I have to cut a few hours off of sleep to get something in, that's what I do. You know what I mean? So like I knew I wanted to run this morning. I'm really into running just for overall health, you know. Do you come up with ideas when you're running? I do. Yeah? I do. And I talk my poor Siri on my Apple phone. I talk to this girl more than I talk to my wife. I'm running. I'm, I have ideas. And I'm saying, hey, Siri, make a note. 
And there she goes. She's ready to go. Do you have music on when you run? When I'm running, I'm listening to other people's music. I hate listening to my own stuff, except for Enemy Eyes. We'll talk about that. So I'm listening to like a lot of metal and a lot of adrenaline style kind of stuff. Like I love pop evil and, you know, bands like that. And so I'm thinking of titles. Usually it's album titles. And I came up with one for the new Crush 40 album that we're going to be working on for Sega during a run. So yeah, I find it very productive to get outside of the studio and have just things happen, you know? But yeah, how do I fit it in? I just have to make the space for it and a lot of good organizing. I've always been pretty good at organizing my day. I start early. I make huge lists, man. Like You're a list guy. I'm a big list paper guy. I am a computer guy, but I'm pen and paper. So that's it. Yeah. I mean, a hundred albums. I started young. Give you a little background. So I started 11 years old. Prior to 11, this is how I I'm segueing into Enemy Eyes. Prior to 11, I was into theater. Between eight years old and and 11, I did a lot of off-Broadway here in the East Coast. I lived very close to New York. And I thought that was going to be my life. And then I started getting into music by watching my brother, who's older, five and a half years older than me. I'm like, I want to be like my brother. Yeah. Wow, look at all the girls going crazy. I want to do this. It was kind of one of those things. And my parents said, listen, you have to make a choice. You're going to be an actor or you're going to be a musician. You can't be both. Well, here I am now, 40 years later, 40, 50, well, okay, maybe a little longer than 40. I'm 55 years old now. I can't believe that either. But here I am at 55 years old going, you know what? I'm going to combine my love for theater with music. Now the birth of Enemy Eyes, because Enemy Eyes takes on a whole creative visual. It's not going to be four guys who jump up on stage, sweat, scream, and good night. It's more. It's going to be a visual experience. I want it to be theatrical with characters. And so we're planning such amazing stuff for 2024. Right. Yeah. So there's a lot of stuff happening with Crush 40 and all my gaming music. There's talks of us being in the new movie, you know, the Sonic 3 movie. Wow. There's a full symphony world tour that we're working on. Bro. Oh, and I thought I was going to go fishing. I thought I'm done. <laughs> I'm going to go fishing and have a cup of coffee yeah. and, that, and that's it. We say watch grass grow, but I don't think I'm going to be watching grass grow yet. Not yet. It's so great, man. I think you said like this new anime I album it's the album you've wanted to make all your life that's a pretty bold but awesome statement to live up to but it's great stuff i mean the description it was teasers like heavy metal melodic metal euro metal and not gonna lie when you say that stuff to me i add in a little cautiously because i'm not the heavy metal guy i used to be but it's great peace and glory what you say great tunes and you ride that line between melody and the hard edge really great and you sound as great as ever oh thank you mate yeah and i mean that's sort of i can't take the melody out of me i'm not a screamo guy i can't do it so i can't be anything than what i am but i did definitely want a heavier you know edge to it like you put it so perfectly and you know we didn't plan on saying hey let's uh, get together and let's make a record that sounds like breaking benjamin or pop evil or you know whoever it just didn't happen like that we're like okay i want to do something heavy and let's just start with some sound and let's see what happens and what's really interesting mate hopefully you find this interesting is i and i can literally show you i went from the paper to the microphone so when we recorded History's Hand, what you hear lyrically, what you read lyrically, and what you hear is straight from the pen and paper right to the microphone. No going back saying, oh, I'm going to change this. I'm going to change it. I would write it and I would sing it. What you hearing is done. Total stream of consciousness kind of thing. <laughs> and for me, that whole spontaneous creative process made it so fun because I just said, no, I'm not going back. I'm not changing anything. I'm going to write it. And what comes out of my mouth goes to that microphone. And that is what we're keeping. And that's what we did. How many tracks did you do for the album in the end? Is it everything we hear on the album or was the as normal, like twice as many songs, which you had to whittle down? Great question. No, what you hear is what we wrote. That's it. And no more. That was it, right? So there. it's like literally just a moment in time. Yes, Boom, there you go. Exactly. And we're not even thinking about writing another song until it's time. We just want everything to be spontaneous. I won't sit down today and grab a guitar and go, da -da 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 -da. oh, that's going to be great for the next Enemy Eyes album. I don't even want to think about it. I want this to have its day. I guess it's kind of like a full circle in a way, bringing back some of your earliest influences, Dio, Rainbow, Maiden. Is this the kind of stuff you were listening to when you were listening to Joey's band Faze Reyes yes! in your basement back in Pennsylvania yes! when you were just a boy? Yeah. Yes, man. It really, really, honestly... 
is. And, you know, and to have the privilege to be able to do the last tour with Ronnie James Dio, that was really special before he passed away. That was special, 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 man. And you're looking at these guys and you go, my God, you know how many speakers I blew up in my basement listening to these tunes? So, yeah, going back to your roots, you know, have those influences drive some of this new music. It's cool, man. It was like the last piece of the puzzle for my career. I used to always say, and I joke around, my family gets mad at me, but I would say, look, look, if I died today, I'm complete. I'm done. I've done everything. You can't name something I haven't done. But you know what? This I haven't done. And now I feel like I've connected the last, like the puzzle's done. I'm like, good. I've always wanted to do this. And I love this album. And I run with it in my ears. And I, I love that song, Praying on Your Weakness, The Chase. I love that song. I really am a fan of this music. So it's been a great experience, man. Super. What bands did Joey get you into? I mean, he says he's five years older than you. Mm -hmm. So we always stayed in this very tight knit Italian family. So the boys always had to stay in the same bedroom. So I was forced to listen to whatever he put on the record player. So it was three major bands, Kiss, Judas Priest, when a guitar player said that there's this group out of England called Judas Priest. When you hear this stuff? And that was like all new to America, man. And that was just like, wow, check this guy out. Look at his leather pants. And then the birth of Scorpions. So those were the three major early influences for my brother. And then we slowly, you know, as time progressed into the 80s, we got into Van Halen and all that melodic kind of hairband stuff. Did you go to shows together or was Joey like, I'm off with my friends. You're too young to be hanging around. You're like, no, let me come. Let me come. I had the coolest brother on earth. No, he took me everywhere under his wing and protected me. And then once I started playing, so the, the story is what happened, how we really connected was we had this basement in the house and that's where his band played. And every night they rehearsed and I sat on the steps behind the drummer and I watched this drummer play. I wasn't a drummer, but I was analyzing how to play the drums. They would leave for the night and I would go down and I'd play this guy's drums. And I knew every song. I mean, when you're a kid, man, when you're 10 years old, you're a sponge. You know, you don't have all the stresses of life and bills and shit you just you're a sponge i learned every song i learned how to play the drums i'd put his sticks back exactly correctly because i didn't want him to know i was playing his drums and one day bro this is as honest to god as i can be he got violently sick and couldn't do a show and i raised my hand i told my brother joey i can do the show and he's like what are you talking about i said let me show you i can play all the songs and i can sing the stuff too did he know you could even play drums no <laughs> He didn't know. So he called the band in and I played and they fired the drummer and I became the new drummer and singer behind the drums. And then it became this thing like, come see the 10 year old drummer play and sing all the Scorpions and Judas Priest songs and stuff like that. What were some of the shows you were doing? Because I mean, that's like super young. So you wouldn't have been doing bars or anything like that. No, I was. I was doing bars, but my parents had to be there as supervision. So they had to be there as guidance, you know. And so, no, I played bars all up and down the East Coast of the U.S. And I didn't see a lot of Mondays or Fridays in school, man, because I was playing. I was playing. It was unbelievable. And I learned a lot on the road. I saw a lot of boobs. I didn't know what boobs were, man. And then I saw different shapes and sizes and some with bras, some without, some in the flesh. It was quite a learning experience. Did that make you pretty cool at school? Yeah, man. Are yeah? you kidding? It didn't make me cool with the principal. Right. Because the principal thought it was just like a kind of like a phase I was going through. And I'm like, no, sir. And I was a real, a little bit of an asshole. I remember telling one of the principals at school, I said, hey, man, I make more money in one night than you do in two weeks. I was a punk. So... <laughs> That didn't go over well, but my friends who I still communicate with today knew that I was laser focused on being a professional musician and, you know, spreading music. They were like, we knew what you were doing. We knew you were going to do it. My friends are outside playing with toys and I was down in the basement playing and writing songs. It's just kind of what my life was supposed to be. I'm probably going to jump a few years, but over time that band became Killer Hit and later Brunette. Yeah. With like this fan base that really grew and grew. What bands were you playing with? Was you doing your own shows or was you, because you're kind of East Coast at this time. So yeah. was you opening for touring bands coming through town or was you heading out doing your own shows? Yeah, all of the above. We did a lot of club shows. 
shows, we tried to support bands. Like I remember when the band Kicks was very popular on the East Coast and we would try to get on as many support shows because we wanted to be in front of people. So that whole phase and killer hit. And it wasn't until we moved out to California around 1987, 88, when Poison was just starting to happen, you know, a lot of those big hair bands. Who pulled the trigger on that saying, we got to go to the West Coast? Was that just inevitable? My brother, man, he always had the great insight of where we had to be. He was like, we got to go to California now. And I was 18 years old. And I'm like, okay, mom, dad, I love you. We're going to go. And bro, we were so poor. We were so poor. Like it was a luxury to get a piece of nice food. Fruit. Like if you had a nice orange or nectarine, we'd label it like Johnny's nectarine. And if you touched it, man, I was going to pound you, man. You don't eat my damn nectarine. So we were so poor and just did everything we could, just laser focused on trying to build a career. How'd you get out there? Did you drive cross country? I never even owned a car. I didn't own a car until I was 21 years old. My brother sold his car and we bought this old Eagle tour bus. This thing was a mess and we gutted it and we built bunks in it and we tried to seal it off. You know, you got really high on diesel fuel because it all leaked and shit. Character building. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And we, I'm I'm sorry, people, but we stole water from places because we needed to fill our water tank. So we had water in the bus to drink and to shower. And we would hook up people's houses, the hoses and take a little bit of their water and go, go. I mean, we were 18 years old and we we're freaking just trying to survive and do our thing. But we had great parent support. And they're like, okay, boys, go and do it, do it, do it. And then, you know, there comes a point you work hard and things start to happen. And then we landed an eight and a half million dollar record deal. And that's kind of like the living the dream. It's not so. I mean, as a fan of that whole scene looking in from over in the UK, even like the brunette part of it, it all sounds so larger than life to me. I believe Poisoned Brett Michaels hooked you up with his publicist, yeah. Deborah Rosner. True. He did some demos with Dana Strum of yeah. Vinnie Vincent Invasion, later Slaughter. Where things moved moving pretty fast once you're out on the west coast or was it like this constant grind because the competition out there was so huge with so many bands well being very very honest with you which because i'd never lie to you bro but no it moved quickly we were a good band we didn't have the songs i know that now we just didn't have the right songs we hold records that broke the doors, broke Van Halen's record. We put people in clubs that were unbelievable, but we never got signed. And they were right. The record companies were right. We were not ready. Dana Strum was instrumental. That was part of our life when we did a movie with Francis Ford Coppola's son, Roman Coppola. And so we got in a little bit of taste of Hollywood movies, which it never came out, thank God, because it was horrible. So things moved quickly, yes. And Brett was definitely a key help in connecting us with one of the greatest PR people at that time, Deb Rosner. You know, today we have influencers and this and that and the other. Back then was, hey man, you got to get in front of people somehow. How are you going to get in front of them? Well, unless you knew someone powerful in PR, you weren't going to just show up in a magazine. So Deb was instrumental in getting us seen. Dana helped refine us musically. There was a lot of moving parts to it. And Brett certainly got us kicked off in the right direction. And then things started to happen from there. Who was the big band on the scene? Like, we want to be on the bill with them. In Hollywood, they had what was called pay to play, right? So you had to pay for your own tickets and then you had to kind of like resell them. We did that only once every show after that was complete sellouts we used to have the big lights and all it was like a big extravaganza when we played it was really cool i mean because i guess tough were in a similar position to you they yeah. was like out there for so long like grinding away yeah so tough was one of the bigger bands that we'd want to do shows with i'm trying to think mate my god was butch walker out there with bite the bullet at that time which went on to be so oh guess. yes yes absolutely yep and then there was doug aldridge and lion when lion played it was a big thing what about the lit dudes with razzle oh yes yes shit man how do you know this <laughs> incredible yeah and then what the hell mr biggs oh racer x so you tried to get onto those shows because you knew that they were going to be filled and we just built an audience so record companies knew that we could draw the people from the visual from a talent perspective but we didn't have the songs and it wasn't until we met neil sean that really took our writing from here to above our heads you and Joey regroup, go back home, look at doing, I think you've described it as a harder edge Nelson Brothers type thing, which is yeah. 
when your brother-in-law, Neil Sean, who I believe was quite a successful musician himself. <laughs> yeah, not bad. <laughs> not bad. Not bad. A few 60, 70, 80 million records sold. Yeah, not yeah. bad. He's learning. You guys form what would become Hardline. Was it intimidating for you at all following the footsteps of Steve Perry, John Waite, arguably two of rock's all-time greatest singers? But I guess both had their own style, so you could come in and do your thing as well. Yeah, I mean, I wasn't intimidated you know, I was more felt grateful and honored that I could be in the same company as those guys. But I was a confident young bastard, man. So I was I was ready to show the world what I could do. Yeah. And it was at a Christmas gathering in my home where my brother and I were playing the song that we were working on for this hard rock Nelson thing. And that's when Neil ran in. He goes, let me see the guitar. And we have never asked him for help up to that point. We never did. And even prior to Hardline, the actual band, we only wanted Neil to participate in producing us, help us refine these songs. Because when he grabs that guitar, man, he is so brilliant, so brilliant. He can just take something that sounds so average and make it 10x by just modifying chords. His chord knowledge is incredible. And he doesn't even know what the chords are. I'll be like, Neil, what is that chord? He's like, I don't know, man. It's um, C sharp something with a bass note of blah, blah, blah. I don't know. He just cracked the code at some point. It yeah. just made sense to him. Right. He just goes, it's like this, man. Just put your fingers here. It's like that. I'm like, shit. Okay. So absolutely one of the most genius musicians out there. And it took my songwriting and our songwriting to a very high level. I think Double Eclipse is known as a very classic, epic record it's a shame that music shifted but you know it is what it is it was like you said a place in time and it's a great record and still it's a great record and we're still playing it today here we are 30 years later i'm still touring playing these songs Neil brought in drummer Dean Castronovo and in turn Dean suggested Todd Jensen on bass. You'd auditioned many, many bass players though, I believe. We did. Anyone you can say who we might have heard of? Oh, I'd rather not say because they didn't get the gig, but some <laughs> top level guys. Yeah. I don't want to make them feel bad. But, you know, my brother and I came out of a, I wouldn't say it was a bad situation with Brunette, but a frustration where like, oh my God, because, you know, working in a band is different than going to an office and working with a bunch of people because you can go home right at the end of the day you can bitch about bobby who was a loud mouth but in a band man i mean you've got to live and breathe each other so that culture has got to be perfect right and so some of these bass players while they were just phenomenal talents didn't fit our culture they didn't get our jokes they didn't get us you know what i mean and Dean kept saying, I know this guy, I know this guy, he's going to fit, he's going to fit. He's out with David Lee Roth right now, but when he comes back, we got to play with the guy Jim. And we immediately, we knew in two seconds, two seconds, we we're like, okay, that's it. And the band was put together. Now, Dean Casanova, I can't stand this guy. I hate this. No, I'm kidding you. I was just with Dean in California. We had a blast together. I love him forever. The album Double Eclipse is very often hailed as probably like the last great album of, I guess, the commercial hard rock genre of the 80s and the early 90s. You obviously weren't aware what was around the corner at the time, but back in April 1992 when it was released, things were still great for hard rock. And I think your very first show with Hardline was opening for Van Halen in Detroit. No pressure. No pressure. Um, I'm in my young 20s. My first live concert as Hardline on an international eight and a half million dollar record deal and 55,000 people. No problem. <laughs> I got this. So I remember, I remember it so well, but again, I was not nervous. I couldn't wait to get out on that stage. I remember talking to Alex Van Halen at the time I was into juicing, juicing carrots and like really healthy, man. I was like my days off and stuff. I was at the gym and poor tour manager. I'm like, find a gold's gym for me. Uh. Anyway, and I was talking to Alex and because he was into juicing, they were getting Van Halen guys were getting really healthy. And I said to him, Alex, I'm looking at all these seats, you know, 55,000 seats. I said, bro, does this look big to you? Like, holy shit, look at this, man. And he just looked at me. He goes, no. <laughs> I just started laughing. I go, really? He goes, no, it's just like another show for us. I went, wow. And anyway, it just took me. I mean, I couldn't believe I was there. But I remember that remark. And I'll tell you why. Because I never, ever wanted to. I respected his, his answer because to him, it just looked like the same show that they've been doing for years and years. I get that. But I never, ever wanted to lose the feeling of, 
holy shit, look at this. You know, that that being grateful for for being able to play at a place like that. So now when I do festivals and I'm playing 25 to 120,000, man, I am just like still in awe of like all these people show up to listen to music. It's so cool. But anyway, I got off track a little bit. Sorry. That's fine. Did I also hear you say that Guns N' Roses add you as their Jet album when they flew to shows? Is that true? Yes. I didn't know this. So like you said, I mean, I'm pretty proud and excited that you just mentioned that Double Eclipse was probably the last of the great, you know, AOR rock albums before the whole thing collapsed. I'm I'm, whew, I'm glad I got in there at the last second, but at least I got in there. But yeah, I learned from Gilby Clark, who we became to know each other. That was one of their favorite albums when they'd fly on their private jet, they'd crank up Hardline. And, and then we got to spend some time with them. And I remember like backstage Berlin. Lynn at the stadium sitting on a blanket with Slash and he still had his hat on and just shooting a shit about music and yeah, it's cool, man. What what a life. It's been incredible. How did it feel for you and Joey and in fact your families as well after so many years of hard work and determination to see everything coming together? Surreal, man. Completely surreal. Although my parents knew that we were going to do this. Really, I mean, we suffered to do it. And sometimes you have to suffer a little bit, go through some pain to get where you need to be, because that's just part of it, you know? And so I sacrificed and we sacrificed a lot. You know, my friends were having normal lives. You know, they had jobs, they had income, they had cars. I had a nectarine, you know what I mean? I had an orange. So, you know, there was a lot of sacrifice for my family, my current family, even today. You know, my tour with Axel Rudy Powell and Hardline started in, and some solo shows started in August. And I just returned home on November 7th. That's a long time to be away from your wife, from your dogs, from your kids. It's a sacrifice, you know, but also I truly believe that any one of us, if we have a gift, we got to use it. We got to use it. And that's what I vowed to do, man. It's kind of like, it's almost a little religious for me. You know what I mean? It's like, I got to use the gift. I am getting old and I am slowing down and the travel is harder. But when you perform and you see how you brighten people, man, like you can see them escape from the world. And I always say that live. I, I said, listen, we are here together. Forget about everything outside of these walls and let's live tonight. And people just go, ah. Because that's what we need, man. We need our, our safety net. We need our music. It's cool. What I'm really excited to talk about is next month, next month Uh oh. is 30 years since you came to the UK with Hardline. Are you kidding me, and man? And opened up for Extreme. Jesus Christ almighty. December 1992. <laughs> all right, here's a great story. Here's a great story. All right. So I show up in England. We're all flying in the economy, but we didn't care. We're like, we're going to England and we're staying at the Mayfair in London. That becomes home base for us. I met Stevie Wonder there. Can you believe it? I'm like, oh my God. But prior to getting this, this is a great story. Cars picked us up, you know, like our limousines picked us up at the airport. And my brother and I had our own car. I don't remember why, but we had our own car. And we're coming into the Mayfair and it's packed with people. I mean, the streets are filled with kids and just like all this mayhem around. I said, oh, my God, Joey, they're here for us. Holy shit, Joey. This is going to be incredible. We've already broke the UK. Yes. We're like, oh, my God, we're playing Wembley two nights. Oh, my God. And we knew Extreme wasn't staying there. So we knew it wasn't for Extreme. And we open the doors, man. We pop out and we're like, no one's looking at us. And I look at my brother and go, wait, this isn't for us. And it was for some little pop stars, these kids that used to wear their clothes backwards. I can't remember, Criss Cross or something, some rapper kids. And I'm like, we laughed, bro. We laughed so hard. We thought that was, we made it. Here we are. Look at those people. They weren't for us. Yeah, the UK will bring you back down. <laughs> you guys smacked the shit right out of us. I got to show you this. Check okay. this out. Oh my God. Look at that. That's from Sheffield. On the 15th of December. Oh, are you kidding How me? How nuts is that? Oh, my God. Rob, that's mind-blowing, bro. What were you, 10? No, I was... What would I be? I would be 18. 18 at that time. Full disclosure, you guys changed my life. How so? Because um, who came out? There was you, Neil, and Todd at Sheffield. Yeah. I was playing guitar at the time. We said, oh, we're coming to Birmingham as well. And Todd says, oh, come and say hello. So you tell that to 18-year-old me. I'm going to come and say hello at the next gig. So... We rocked up. I was banging on the back door. Say, oh, Todd Jensen says, come to say hello. This guy looked at me, gone out like, 
who's this idiot? But he says, give me a minute. Ten minutes later, Todd comes out in the freezing cold and talks to me and my friend for like 15 minutes. Wow! After that, I was like, Todd Jensen plays bass. I'm going to play bass. So I've been playing bass in bands for the last 20 some years now. No <laughs> shit. Yeah. Mate, you guys changed my life. That's incredible, mate. That's absolutely incredible. But I can always remember you coming out on stage saying, get up, get up. And you made everybody get up because these were all like seated arenas. Yeah. So you made everyone get up before you started the song. Damn straight, man. There ain't no sitting. Even my grandmother got up on Van Halen. I couldn't believe it, man. She's like, no, I'm standing on that seat. She stood. We used to stand on our seats, man. That's what we did. Awesome. Oh, yeah. Oh, that is an incredible story. It's unbelievable. Yeah. Birmingham was NEC, right? Yeah. I remember, man. There are shows that you remember. So here's a funny Wembley story. So my wife, she was my girlfriend at the time, came with me. My family, my mother and father flew in. I mean, this was a big thing. Playing Wembley, two nights sold out. Extreme. Hardline extreme. How does that happen, you know, when you're a punk young kid? And my wife hits me because we're backstage. She hits me. She goes, look at that guy over there. He thinks he's Roger Daltrey. And I said, honey... That is Roger Daltrey. <laughs> it was like chin on the ground. And then we had our own catering. You know, we brought our own ovens and the whole thing. You know, Extreme was very big at that time. And Hardline was just kind of following them around, you know, basically. And I remember I came backstage after sound check, and my wife is sitting with Brian May. And they're having food backstage. And I think it was his wife at the time, I think Brian May. And they're all talking. And I stopped, bro. I stopped and I looked and I just went, what is happening? happening to my life that's brian may you imagine if you had cell phones back then that'd be nuts yeah right you imagine and you know what we never took any fucking pictures what was wrong with us my wife and i still today we say why did we take a damn picture because she was in the moment he was in the moment in the moment there was a picture of sammy hagar his big nose and my big nose singing together on stage, nose to nose. Some photographer out there has that picture. I saw it and I'm like, oh, wow, that's really cool. And my day went on. Instead of saying, hey, can I get that picture? I would give a left leg, well, maybe a foot or a toe for that picture. I mean, there's great shit out there and you just think it's going to continue forever. And just, yeah, like you said, in that moment. Ah. Was the talk of you guys coming back with Bon Jovi the following year? Have I made that up? So I think where that got a little mixed up was that Wayne Isham, who was Bon Jovi's videographer for all those big Bon Jovi videos, was working with us. And so there might have been some chatter about Hardline and Bon Jovi, but it never it never came to full tilt. Yeah, it was just kind of talk. Other than seeing you guys play live, I say, put me on a path. I've filled in for bands like the Bullet Boys and Jet Boy and all that kind of thing. Jet Boy! Shit, yeah. forgot about them. But one thing that Hardline did introduce me to early on was the interaction you had with fans back then when it was through... You had a fan club, it was through letters and stuff. You guys would write to people, even over here in the UK. And it was this really small, tiny community, but really connected. One which I think nowadays, had it happened with social media, that would have been huge. Did it ring true for you guys back then? Whilst you had the big names in the band, a major label record deal, you were still doing things on a grassroots approach too. Was that important? Was you behind that? Who was behind all that? Do you remember? Yeah, no, absolutely. As a matter of fact, it was like the record deal and starting, even with with Neil, I mean, Neil's a trooper, man. Neil, Neil is a, a real musician. We vowed to do a meet and greet after every show and sign and touch every single person, no matter how long it took, bro. And sometimes it was two, three hours after we would sign and talk to every single person after every hardline show. No, I mean, that's the life blood of your career and your music so i'm still holding this thing <laughs> yeah you see what i'm saying you know what that meant to you right i mean it's really that grassroots i mean that's the foundation of your career you've got to do it here's a great story i know we're running out of time but i, oh, I got so, so we were in france we we're doing a promotional tour for double eclipse and we we're at this very very exclusive restaurant and there were some fans and they asked for an autograph and I didn't have a pen. And this older couple said, oh, here, you can use my pen. I said, oh, you're from America. 
And they said, yes, we are. We're touring around. I said, oh, wonderful. Thank you so much for your pen. And I signed for these fans, took some pictures, blah, 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 the whole thing. And here you go, sir. Here's your pen back. A year later, we're doing a U.S. tour and we're doing exactly what I said, Rob. We're hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people lined up to do a meet and greet. And this older couple comes up to the table and says, do you remember being in France and you borrowed a pen in the Jeteau Les Vigevois, whatever restaurant. And I said, I do. And the man goes, it was my pen. And we're huge fans. They heard us talking and they went and they bought Double Eclipse. They became huge fans. And there they were. I don't remember if we were in Minneapolis. I don't remember where we were. And it was like, that was my pen. And that is the epitome of grassroots, man, talking and being with the fans. Johnny, I'll bring it to a close because I could talk about this stuff all day. Me too, mate. I want to wish you all the best with Enemy Eyes and the future of Hardline. I look forward to seeing you back in the UK very, very soon rob thank you brother thank you for all you do and your support and your love and belief for music man mate it's been a pleasure be well brother i'll talk to you soon hope to see you out there sometime Huge thanks to the awesome Johnny G. O'Reilly for chatting with me on today's Straight to Video podcast. That really was a treat to share some of my early musical memories with such an amazing singer and rock and roll journeyman. Remember, the new album from Enemy Eyes is out now and all up-to-date Hardline news can be found at hardlinerocks.com. We're getting close to the end of 2022, just a couple more episodes until our Christmas break and I massively appreciate all the support you've shown to the show this year. All previous episodes can be found at stvpod.com and there's also a brand new website for the Straight to Video 80s Video Shop with an updated merch page all over at www.80svideoshop.co.uk so if you have time please check that out too. All right, that is all for today's show. I'll catch you again with a brand new episode next Friday so till then take care and speak soon. <laughs>